Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the video, guys, why do we encounter turbulence when we transition through clouds? And what are those strange and scary noises? Today I'll be covering the five things that makes people most nervous during the descent and approach. So stay tuned. Wind 310 at 16, this video is brought to you in cooperation with brilliant.org now if you want a truly fun and interactive way to kind of sharpen up your brain cells and do something else than just idly watching youtube i highly recommend you to use this link here below the five on the first of you who does so will get a 20 percent discount to the annual fee of brilliant you get daily challenges and you will get ways to you know go in try different courses there's loads and loads of stuff to discover so Check it out. Right guys, so flying. The most relaxing, most fun way to travel. You're sitting there by your window seat, looking out, seeing the clouds pass below you, seeing the almost endless horizon. And you're thinking about how fun it will be when you reach your destination. Or it is absolutely horrendous. You're listening for every single noise that is out there. You're, fine, you're feeling every shudder of the aircraft and you're thinking now, Today is going to be the time that we're going to fall down. Right? The difference between those two views of flying an aircraft can be what you know about what's going on, your knowledge about the situation. And that's what we're going to be concentrating on today. So I've already done a video about that sinking feeling you get on takeoff. I highly recommend you to check that out. But today we're going to be focusing on the feelings that you feel when the aircraft is descending and approaching the airport. What are all those noises and all of those vibrations that you're feeling? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about what actually initiates the descent, right? When you feel that all of a sudden the engines goes from that kind of equal, even humming to suddenly going down to being almost quiet and the aircraft just suddenly pitches down. What is that? Well, first of all, you need to know approximately when this happens. So uh, normally we'll be cruising between 36,000 and 40,000 feet generally speaking. To get down from that altitude takes about 30 to 35 minutes to do. Okay? In a perfect world, a perfect flight would be a max thrust climb up to our cruise altitude and then an immediate idle descend down to our destination. So it will be like a parabola. Now, in most cases, we have a quite lengthy cruise section as well because we actually have to go somewhere. So. Um, we have to calculate when to start a descent in order to achieve an idle descent because we want to do an idle descent. It's the most economical way of doing it. Uh, it is the most environmentally friendly and the lowest noise way of doing it. So the way we tend to calculate this is we look at our altitude. We need in a 737-800 about three times our altitude in nautical miles plus one nautical mile for each 10 knot to decelerate down to 200 knots. So this means that if we are flying at a cruise altitude, it tends to be at a Mach number there, but it's going to be an indica indicated speed of about 250 knots. So if we're at 40,000 feet, 250 knots, we need 40 times 3, that's 120, uh, plus 1 knot for each 10 knots down to 200, so that's another 5 miles. So we need 125 miles in order to descend from our cruise altitude to our destination, right? So like I said, that will happen at about 35 minutes prior to, um, to a landing. And it's also very often uh, preceded by the PA from the pilots. Because the way we do this is that when we are done briefing for the approach, everything is set up and ready, well then the pilot flying will take the PA mic up and they will give the PA to the passengers. This is different if you're doing a long haul flight, but doing a short or medium haul flight, this tends to be it. So you'll hear the PA and a couple of minutes later, the descent will come perfectly normal and the way that the sound goes down from you know quite loud to almost silent also normal because we tried to do an idle descent down to our destination All right number two cloud transition so this is by far the biggest reason that people get nervous during the descent. When I've been asking people about this nervous flight, they always bring this up. Why is it that you might be descending, it's perfectly still clear, no turbulence whatsoever, and as soon as you enter into cloud, the aircraft starts shaking and you start feeling uh, you know, either quite bad turbulence, but at least a little bit of turbulence. 
But in order to understand this, you need to understand how clouds are formed in the first place. So if you're looking at these nice kind of fluffy white good weather clouds, uh, they're called cumulus clouds, and they form when um, the sun heats up an area of the ground to a, a point where a bubble of hot and moist air is released from the ground. Now that bubble, which has the, the moisture inside of it, climbs upwards. And as it climbs upward, the temperature inside of the bubble decreases with something called the dry adiabatic lapse rate, which is about three degrees per thousand feet. So it will continue to get colder and colder. And at some point, the, uh, the water vapor that's inside of this air bubble will reach its dew point. And when it does, it, the water vapor will turn into droplets. And that's what you see when the clouds are forming. This is also why, if you're looking out on a good weather day, you see that all clouds are almost at exactly the same altitude. The cloud base, as we call it. That's because all of them are kind of cooling down at the same lapse rate. And when they reach the dew point, which is going to be fairly even in a, you know, a normal, uh, fairly large geographical area, they will form these clouds. And when they do, that lapse rate will go from dry adiabatic lapse rate to wet adiabatic lapse rate. So instead of, of cooling down with about three degrees per thousand feet, it's now about one and a half degree per thousand feet, if I remember my ATPL theory correctly. Um, and that's because when the, uh, the water vapor goes to droplets, it's actually releasing energy. It goes from a higher energy state to a lower energy state and releases energy. And that's the change in lapse rate. And when that happens, it will cause changes in conformity in the way that the, the air is moving. So you'll have slightly different um, air movement inside of the clouds. You will also have a little bit of different density inside of the cloud. But also the fact that the cloud still is moving upwards is also causing turbulence. So this is why when you come and you descend and you get into the cloud, you immediately get into this difference in lapse rate and this difference in en energy state and the actual fact that the air is moving upwards and that will cause turbulence. Okay, so this means that whatever cloud that you come into, you will feel a certain amount of turbulence, right? The more uniform, big white clouds that covers a large area will normally be less turbulence because they're not formed by this kind of upward movement, uh, but they will still cause a little bit of turbulence, okay? Now, is this dangerous then? No, okay. Um, all of these clouds will have moisture in them, but we in front, the pilots, we will have our weather radar constantly scanning. As soon as we go into clouds, the weather radar is scanning and we're looking for it. Okay? And what we're looking for is intense areas of turbulence and intense areas of air movement. And we'll see that as a red area or an orange area on our weather radar. And when we see that, we just turn and stay clear of it because we, will, we don't want you know, severe turbulence, obviously, but uh, we also don't want to get close to something that could cause um, thunderstorms or anything like that. So we stay clear of that. If we are descending straight through a cloud and you feel some turbulence, it means that we're watching a weather radar and there's nothing there. It's just a little bit of turbulence, not dangerous, not for the aircraft, not for you. What you might see is the seatbelt sign coming on. It probably comes on before we go through the clouds already um, to make sure that everyone's sitting down and you're not gonna spill your hot coffee over yourself, right? Number three, changes in configuration. So the first thing that you might notice when it comes to this is if we are during the descent, all of a sudden you start to feel a kind of high frequency shudder in the aircraft. If you look out on the wings then, you will probably see some panels that are standing up on the wings. Now, these uh, are called spoilers, air spoilers. And what we're doing at that point is we're trying to get rid of some energy of the aircraft. That might be because we have calculated on a, um, on a specific arrival route that gives us the amount of track miles that we need. Remember, we talked about how much track miles we need to descend. But all of a sudden, our traffic control comes in and tells us, listen, there's no traffic, you can go straight for the ILS and give us a shortcut. Now, we will have too high energy state then, as in the aircraft will be too high up, that's the potential energy, and potentially with too high speed. And the way that we get rid of that is we increase the speed, that will give us a bit more drag, and we also use the speed brake. And when the speed brake is being pulled up, those spoilers comes up, and that causes this kind of low um, rumbling, this high frequency buffeting that you're feeling. 
perfectly normal. It's either that or our traffic control has kept us high because there's been traffic passing below us. So we need to start descending rapidly. In any case, it is used to, to, to take down the energy state of the aircraft to get it into a position where we can start our approach. That's the first thing that I wanted to mention. The second thing is probably when you start feeling that flaps are coming out. Now, what you need to understand is that uh, when we get closer to the airport, we need to start slowing the aircraft down. And the reason for that is because the wings of the aircraft, they're built to fly as economically and efficiently as possible at high altitude, at high speed. But as we're getting into land, we need to get the aircraft down to speed where we can slow it down on the runway, because the runway is only so long, okay? And the way to do that is simply changing the shape and the, the size of the wings. So we have something called high lift devices. Those are the flaps that you see on the back side of the wings that are being extended and moved downwards and the slats that comes out in the front. There's also something called Kruger, Kruger flaps on the front of the wings on the 800. But what they do is they extend the surface area of the wings and they change the cord as in the angle that the wing has in order to enable us to fly having the same amount of lift as we need to keep the aircraft flying, but at much, much lower speed. And we need to do that at a fairly early stage. So prior to 10 nautical miles, that's about, what, 20, well, 18 and a half kilometers away from the runway, uh, we will start to extend those flaps. And what you will feel is, once again, that little kind of high frequency shudder. And you might also feel that you are kind of moving forward, like you're being decelerated in your seat. That's the first couple of flap steps. As we get closer to the runway, we will take more and more flaps. And the more flaps we get, the more lift the aircraft will, will take out and also the more drag it will have. So with the last couple of flap steps, down from flaps 15 to flaps 30 or 40, you will feel how the aircraft is kind of ballooning upwards. This is something we, we practice a lot with our cadets when they start learning to fly the, the aircraft, that as they take these final flap settings, the aircraft will you know, essentially climb upward again, and they need to be ready for that and counteract it with some forward push on the yoke in order to maintain the glide slope during the descent. So this is what you will feel. And you can also, if you're sitting over the, uh, the overwing exits or over the wheel well bay, you might hear kind of a metallic whirring sound, like, like that. That sound is the hydraulic motors that's driving the uh, flaps out because the flaps are being driven out by like a screw, right? It's a screw that's, that's kind of moving them outwards to make sure that they move at exactly the same rate so that we don't get any uh, adverse kind of handling from it. So you will hear that moving and that is, the, you know, this is these screws that, that's moving the flaps outwards. So don't be worried. The next configuration change that everyone thinks about is when we drop the gear. Now that will happen at about five nautical miles or four nautical miles away from the runway. So this is the last kind of three minutes of the flight. And what happens is that we, when we move the gear down, that will release the mechanical uplock that holds the gear in place. And when it does, the load of the gear plus hydraulic motors will move the gear into position and lock it in position. And when it does, you'll hear the kind of click and that um, sound is when these huge landing gears goes out into the airstream. You have to remember that when this happens, we are flying with probably 300 to 350 kilometers per hour. So if you take this big landing gear and you put it into an airstream that's moving at 350 kilometers per hour, you will get a lot of drag. So you'll feel that, you'll move forward once again, and also you will hear it. It'll be this low rumbling noise. And that is the, just the air flowing past the gear, okay? Perfectly normal. So, the next thing, number four. What is up with these changes in thrust on final approach? Why does it go from being fairly uniform during the entire cruise and descent, and all of a sudden, when you get onto the final approach, the aircraft starts moving around all over the place and you can hear the engines revving up and revving down all the time? Well, this is because when we get down into the lower uh, air layers, there's going to be more mechanical turbulence. So if there's a little bit windy outside or if you're on a nice clear day and the sun is heating up the surface, you'll get these um, air bubbles that I talked about earlier coming up 
they cause a bit of turbulence, okay? And when we're descending in towards the runway, we need to keep ourselves both bang on the lock glider and glide slope, like we are pointing exactly the right way towards the runway. We cannot let the aircraft deviate either left or right or up or down. So it becomes more and more um, important for us to manually keep the aircraft where it's supposed to do. When we're descending, it doesn't really matter. But when we're on the glide slope, on the localized set, it would need to be bang on. And that requires more kind of fine tuning of the controls. And also, as we're getting closer to the runway, when we have all of our flaps hanging out, we have a smaller speed margin that we need to keep in, okay? Because we cannot go slower than our minimum speed, that would be dangerous. And we cannot go much higher either, because with all of these flaps hanging out, uh, they have a maximum speed because we don't want to put too much pressure on these huge flaps that's hanging out. So that gives us a fairly small speed margin. So we need to be both very accurate on our speed keeping and very accurate on our lateral and uh, horizontal distance. And this means that will be more and smaller changes. So the more turbulent it is, the more changes you will hear. And that is just because we are sitting up in the front, doing our job, getting the aircraft into that sweet spot we need to fly in order to land the aircraft at the correct point on the runway. Now the last and final point I want to mention are hard or firm landings and the use of reversal. So, when we're flying into airports, especially when we're flying into shorter airport, but any airport really, we have a very defined area on the runway called the touchdown zone. That's where the aircraft is calculated to land. It's not in the first part of the runway, like people might think that we want to land as early as possible. It is about 300 meters in on the runway. We need to pass the, um, the threshold at about 50 feet altitude, and then we will come down, we will flare, and we will land about 300 meters in on the runway. That's where we should land, and that's where we must land, because all of our calculation when it comes to landing distance is based on this, okay? Now, a very soft landing normally entails us doing a longer kind of protracted flare, and when we do that, we tend to miss at least the beginning of the touchdown zone, right? We're eating more runway, and whenever the aircraft is flying, it's eating a lot of runway. And if you're flying into a long runway, Charles de Gaulle, London Heathrow, wherever it might be, that doesn't really matter. You have plenty of runway. But if you're flying into a short runway, that might be the difference between landing and having to do a bulk landing, actually go around from a low altitude and try again. So this is why professional pilots always aim to land exactly where they're supposed to. 305 meters in, that's it. No matter how long the runway is, that's where this should be landing. So we are counting on doing that. That's our priority. A soft landing might or might not happen. It is more important that it's a firm landing on the mark than it's a soft landing further in on the runway. Use of reverses depends a little bit on a couple of things. Both is the runway slippery. If it is slippery, well then we will use as much reverses as possible in order to reduce our landing distance. It also might depend on how quickly we need to turn the aircraft around and go back out again. Because if we have a short turnaround time, well then we might need to use the reverses in order to bring uh, a lot of energy away from the brakes so that the brake can cool down and be cool enough in order for us to do our takeoff later on. But generally speaking, hard braking and a lot of reverses only tends to mean that either it's a short runway, but in most cases, we just have different intersections on the runway, which we can take in order to taxi back to the terminal. So if you have a, an intersection that you want to take in order to minimize the taxi time, we might brake harder than we would do because of runway length. We have plenty of runway left, but we don't want to spend 10 minutes taxiing, so we try to make the first exit so that we can taxi slowly and uh, you know, get back to the terminal quickly and get you guys off so that you can go on to whatever you're going to. And that tends to be it, guys. That, that, those are the five biggest reasons that people are nervous during the descent. And as always, I would like to know if you have more things that you want me to explain. Maybe there are things that I missed here that you want me to explain further. Just go into the Mentor Aviation app, just tag at Mentor in the chat, and I will, if I'm in the app, I will respond to you directly. Okay. 
I want to send a huge thank you to the sponsor of this episode, which is Brilliant.org. Now, if you haven't checked them out already, you really should do, okay? Uh, it is a way to keep your brain active. They have loads of interactive, really fun interactive courses where you can go in and learn probability, for example, so that you'll be a better blackjack player. Or they will give you these kind of brain nuts to crack with a daily challenge every day that will send to you. And I highly recommend you to sit down and just spend maybe 10 15 minutes every day to try to crack that one. You'll feel better after having done it. And if you can't crack it, well then they will have a good explanation showing you exactly what it is that you need to think about in order to, cr to crack the problem and you will get better at it. All right. So the uh, 500 first of you who uses this link here below will get a cracking 20% off the annual fee of using Brilliant. But like I always say, it's completely free to go and check it out. So go down, click the link, check it out. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Right, guys, I really hope that you liked that. If you want more content like that, more aviation content, well then, check this out. Uh, I hope that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the little notification bell. See you inside of the Mentor Aviation app and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye-bye.